Our guest tonight is WWE Hall of Famer, the Million Dollar Man, Ted DiBiase. How you doing? Doing great, guys. How are you? So excited, so excited to have you. Uh, we're coming to theaters nationwide on November 7th. The movie The Price of Fame looks at the highs and lows of your career and your life and then your journey to the faith. Uh, what are you hoping to accomplish with the release of this film? Uh, basically, when people walk away from this, uh, I'm hoping, number one, that they'll realize that there's hope. Uh, you know, this shares a struggle of, of my own. Uh, the price of fame, um, uh, you know, don't, I don't want it to be misinterpreted as, oh my gosh, well, you know, like uh, fame, all these things, all these things can happen, but it's what you do with it. It's in, it's individual decision. Uh, but fame is not what everybody thinks it is. And, um, uh, for example, people will say, oh my gosh, it must be a thrill to be in an arena full of people, 40, 50, the largest crowd I've ever wrestled in, 80,000 people. And they're screaming your name, and they know who you are. Okay, that's great. But when that show's over and you go back to your hotel room, you're looking at four walls and a TV, and if your wife and your family are 20 miles away or 2,000 miles away, they're not there with you. And that's where a lot of this stuff starts, and it's about accountability. But what I want people to really realize walking away from this is that what everybody seems to think in the world that this, you know, if, if I have this great job and I make a lot of money and I've got a nice house and a big car and all this stuff, I'm going to be happy. Guys, I had that. And not only did I have it, but I, you know, Vince McMahon afforded, I was, uh, you know, he was promoting me. I, he was he was sending me everywhere, first class, Learjets, limousines, the whole star treatment. And I came to a place in realizing that with all of that, if I didn't have the the love and respect of my wife and my children, I didn't have anything. I didn't have anything that mattered, and that, and that's that's really a, now that's I, I'm odd for the guy that played the million dollar man who said money was everything, uh, but it's not. You know, uh, it's so superficial you can't believe because I came to that place, and that's what this story is about. So I'm hoping that people can come away with it realizing that. Uh, happiness, happiness, happiness is not about money and stuff and being cool. Uh, you know, it's about character and integrity. It's about, uh, it's about, it's not about what you get so much as how much you give. And that's what I'm trying to do with my life now. Mike, your next question. Your uh, son, Ted Jr., plays a huge role in The Price of Fame, and he tells your story to the viewing audience. What was it like working with him on this project, and how did his involvement impact you, especially when he would talk about some of the difficulties that you battled through? Well, I mean, uh, it, it was all part of the process, and and um, again, uh, I, the things I value the most, you know, my family, um, my wife, and my sons, and uh, um you know, when this all broke down with my wife and I, I can way back when when it first came out, one of the things that she said to me was she said, in spite of what you've done to me, you're a great dad. And she goes, I don't want to destroy that. And she said, so until these boys are old enough to understand this, they don't know about it. And so it was never spoken about. And But at the same time, I started going to churches and telling the story. And so my boys had sat in church and they'd heard me tell the story and, 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 you know, very candidly and honestly and, and, uh, forthrightly. And, but, you know, I waited for them to come to me with the question. So when this project came up, you know, my son said, uh, dad, how about we put a twist on the story and we tell the story, but maybe we tell it through, to our eyes. And I said, that's good because, you know, it's, this is not just going to reach struggling married couples. This is about a father and son relationship as well. And I speak about father and son relationships and how important it is. Uh, we have 30% of the children in the United States being raised without dads. Uh, the breakdown of the family is the breakdown of our society as far as I'm concerned. And it starts with the dad. So that's, that's the other big part of this that, uh, that I see and, and that I hope people come away with come away from the film understanding Brendan Gavin next question well without spoiling much because we are very excited to see the movie are there any moments you can share with us from the film that you're most excited for fans to see or learn 
Um, gosh, um, uh, the things that were, uh, I guess, surprising to me because I didn't get to see them until um, until the whole the whole thing was put together. Um, Pete, the guy who put this thing together, um, directed the whole deal. He he went and he interviewed several of my contemporaries. So there's there's uh, there's comments in there from the guys like Terry Funk and and Roddy Piper, who's no longer with us, and uh, George Animal Steel, who's no longer with us. Um, and uh, so to hear these guys, you know, speak about this and and and, and me and 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 the impact my story has had on them was was kind of special for me so without giving any of that away i i would think that uh i think the fans will find that pretty interesting as well well we, we spoke to you before about your road to redemption uh but how did the price of fame movie actually come to fruition and were you hesitant at all about sharing your story on such a large stage um you know, since I got well, since I got saved and I started doing ministry and traveling and speaking, you know, I I've become extremely transparent, and that's hard for men to do. I mean, you put you know you put a bunch of women in a room, give them twenty minutes, and they're pouring out their lives to each other. But you know, it's like you put a guy, a bunch of guys in a room, and you ask somebody how he's doing, and the guy's life might be falling apart, but his pride's not going to let him tell you, and it's it's going to you know, hey, I'm doing fine, and he's not doing fine. Um, but when I really came to that place of brokenness and, uh, you know, set aside my pride, uh, I, I totally set it aside. Um, but as far as how it came to fruition, um, the director, Pete, you know, Pete approached me uh, about doing what they call in the wrestling world a shoot interview. In other words, it's not the wrestling gaga. It's 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 real life questions. And when you start asking me real life questions about my real life. I'm going to start telling you about what Jesus has done in it. And um, what I didn't know at the time, in this, in Pete's own words, he said, I was the son, I am the son of a minister. And at the time, I was very much backslidden. And uh, he said, it's talk, it was kind of like God snuck up on me and through your story just, you know, like hammered me in the head. And it was like a wake-up call for Pete. And so as my relationship with Pete grew, he, he approached me about, about doing the film, you know, and his his line of work, he does, he does uh, wedding photography and video. So he's he's doing wedding documentaries all the time. But this was his first shot at at, at something like this. And um, I'll be honest with you guys. I mean, the first time it's my story, and I've told my story, uh, you know, hundreds of times. But when I sat down and watched this, uh, it brought me to tears. It's my story. So I was, uh, you know, very, very pleased with Pete. That's that's the way it came about. Mike, here, next question. One theme of the Price of Fame is how your in-ring persona influenced you in some ways outside the ring. Um, and you enjoyed so much success in wrestling as the Million Dollar Man. But how do you think your life outside of the ring might have been different if you were never given that gimmick? Uh, you know, that that's hard to say. Um, um, I mean, I was. I'd been in the wrestling business for 12 years already prior to going to the WWF and becoming this character. Um, but it was like, I don't know. It was like, uh, there was already a fire burning and this just poured gasoline on the fire. I went from, you know, regional wrestling and, uh, flying occasionally to in, in, in where you're doing most of your trips by car uh, you know, your television show is taped in a TV studio and not in a coliseum, and all of a sudden it's all changed. And not only that, uh, I'm, I'm the Million Dollar Man, and Vince McMahon is going to market my character by making the public believe I'm really that guy. So I'm, I'm f traveling everywhere in first class, Lear jets and limousines, and just way over the top. And uh, uh, and it's not so much I became the character. I mean, I didn't treat people like the character treats people on television. I mean, I was I was nice to fans. I signed autographs and all that stuff. But the ego trip was in overdrive, and that's where it influenced me the most. Uh, and I don't know um, uh, those same you know those same demons are there regardless. But uh, you know, then we go to being wrestlers to almost like rock stars. We're not just traveling around this circuit 
in in an area. We're traveling the United States. We're traveling to Europe. We're going everywhere, and um, it just literally went to. And it's, it's you know, and here's the thing. I love my wife and I love my children. There was never a question. There was no problem in my marriage. Uh, yet I'm I'm out committing adultery. You know I, what it was was an ego trip. And I'm just telling you, the minute the minute that I realized that the cat was out of the bag, and my wife knew all this stuff, it was like, you idiot! You have put at risk the most important relationship in your life. Not only your wife, but you have put at risk this, the future, the stability, and the well-being of your children. For what? To stroke your ego? Guys, it doesn't get any uglier than that, and that's what I was looking at, and that was that was that was my, uh, uh, I mean, my real come to Jesus moment when I, you know, uh, again, Scripture says, you know, until a man comes to the end of himself, you can't reason with him. You know, you can preach to somebody all day long. Um, but until he comes to a place where he realizes that he's empty and he needs it, then he's not going to listen to you. And uh, that's the journey. I, I, be, I believe it's like, it's like God being my dad saying, okay, son, you think you can go ahead, go get all that stuff you think you want. And one day down the road, we're going to, you know, when you, when you think that you've got everything you want and you're real happy, we're, we're going to have another, con- we're going to have another discussion about this. And, uh, and, uh, you know, he definitely got my attention. BG, next question. You're one of the most iconic wrestlers of all time. So what is it like for you now going out in public and being recognized by fans? And how much do you expect that to intensify after the price of fame releases? Uh, well, I mean, it's it, it, it's really amazing, to be honest with you. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm 63 years old. I haven't had a pair of tights on in 20-some-odd years. And and not been on television regularly in a long time and everywhere I go, you know, I mean, I I was in Europe last year and my seven year old little boy walking by me with his grandmother said, that's a million dollar man. I went, no way. I said, how do you know me, son? He said, video games and the network. So it's incredible. But, um, I, you know, I expect it to pick up, you know, and hopefully it's going to, you know, I, I, again, I, I want it to have a very positive effect. Again, I want people to realize I would want them to pause and think, you know, what's really important in life. And the other thing is, is that there's, is that there is hope that if, you know, uh, that, that you can reconcile, uh, you know, my wife talks about it all the time. She said, when you hang on to anger and bitterness and unforgiveness, it's like drinking poison and expecting somebody else to die. The only one suffering from it is you. Uh, and you know, if if you if you hang on to it long enough, it grows and it grows, and pretty soon, you know, it's not an infant anymore. It's a toddler, and then it's a, a teenager, then it's a full grown adult. You're carrying around on your back, and it'll take you to your grave. The only only one suffering is you, and so you got you, you need to learn how to let it go. Well, it's a process, and and you know the other thing that my wife would say to you is, don't look at me as some kind of hero because you know I struggled through this you know as much as 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 I did, I was on the receiving end of grace and forgiveness. Uh, my wife had the the, the, the the tough job. She really did. Uh, but she said, don't call me a hero because I wasn't a hero. She goes, I struggled with it, and it took me a long time. And uh, But as my wife be- began to see the priorities in my life shift and turn around, and as, as basically as she, as she began to see my life bear fruit, uh, that's when things started to change, and uh, the result is, I mean, today I can tell you with with 100% assurance, my wife is absolutely my very best friend. Um, Bette Medler sings a song, The Wind Beneath My Wings, and every time I hear it, I tear up because that's my wife. That's what she means to me. That's fantastic. Well, listen, most wrestling fans only know you as the Million Dollar Man, but they didn't get the chance to see you uh, wrestling in the territory days. How did that persona come to fruition, and what are your what are some of your favorite moments while playing the role? Uh, the Million Dollar Man, the, the character is actually a Vince McMahon original. I mean, uh, um, it was presented to me, and uh, Vince kind of started laying it out, but in a, in a moment where he was called away and I was just sitting there with Pat Patterson, who at the time was his right-hand man. 
Pat looked at me and he said, Ted, he said, if Vince could be a character in his own show, this is it. This is, you know, this is who he would be. And it was like, uh, it had never been done before. Uh, but, you know, Vince said, he said, I chose you, Ted. He says, because you're, you're articulate, you carry yourself well. Uh, you know, I, you know, he says, you interview very well and you're a great wrestler. He says, you're just, you're, you're perfect for this. So, um, that's how it, you know, that's how it came to fruition. And real reality is that when I left, if you, if you watched as, as Vince, uh, you know, for the longest time, you know, everybody thought that Vince McMahon was just, the the announcer. <laughs> you know, they didn't know he owned the company, but as Vince, you know, injected himself more and more into his own program, you know, he actually kind of became that character. And a quick follow up here. I usually don't do this, but I, I have to ask this. One of the, the the moments from my childhood that I remember the most was that little boy dribbling the ball like ten times, nine times, and then you kicked it away on the tenth time. Why did you, you do that to me as a child? That's what, this is more of just an emotional <laughs> outrage. Like you, I was so devastated yeah. when you did it to that poor child. Like what went through well, your head when you were told you were doing that? And was that kid smartened up to it, or was he smartened up to it afterward? And and of all of the things I have done, every time I do an interview, I get asked the same question. <laughs> as a matter of fact, I think the W well the WWE actually put out you know I you know so it's funny I'm 63 years old and I have new action figures coming out. But they put out an action figure, and in the in the box with the figure, there was like it looked like a gold briefcase, you know, that I carried the money in, and a basketball. <laughs> I could not believe it. There was a basketball in there. But the the truth is, you know, all of the things we did on television, they were staged, they were set up, and all of the people got the money. And I mean, and then at live events, I would do things that were just off the cuff. You know, it was no prearranged. I would just actually have at the end of the match, I'd pick somebody out of the crowd and have them come in the ring and do something stupid and then give them 300 bucks. Uh, but the thing with this little boy, we rehearsed it. Uh, they knew they they got the money. But when we did it live, I had to be the million dollar man. I had to be hardcore. And when you know, my voice is deep and it carries. And when I said, when you don't get the job done, you don't get the money. Scaredy. <laughs> and you know, cro crocodile tears. He ran to his mother. I mean, he couldn't have done it any better. Uh, and and of course, when I got in the back, you know, everybody's high fiving and going, "Yes, yes, yes, that is that is great." And I said, "I'm glad you're all happy." Now, could somebody please find an armored vehicle to get me out of this building? Because <laughs> the people were just like, "Oh my gosh!" And so I've heard it. I've just I've heard it for for 20 years. <laughs> Mike, you're next question. <laughs> Yeah, um, recently the wrestling world and its fans have been celebrating the life uh, of the late Bobby the Brain Heenan. What are your thoughts of Brain uh, as a performer and as a man, and what are some memories that really stick out to you in terms of interactions with him, either in front of or away from the camera? Well, you know, Bobby Heenan to me was, uh, was he was the best. I mean, of, of, of all the guys that, that have been managers that could pick up a microphone and, and, and talk, he was a natural, and he was so good. And I mean, and, and and his character, like mine, was was he was so hated. I mean, it was like the, you know, you you little weasel, you know. Everybody just wanted to kill him, and that that was just the whole point. But Bobby, Bobby Heenan was as quick witted off the camera as he was on the camera, and just as funny. A uh, great guy, uh, you know. Um, I just thought the world of him as as a person, you know. Uh, um, you know, you know, married for a long, long, long time. I can't remember exactly how long his wife and he were married, but uh, you know, of course, in a business like ours, that's that's rare. Um, and, you know, and then after he got the the cancer and lost his jaw and everything, uh, there were several times that I, I had the opportunity to see him, and of course, his wife was always with him, and she would have to, she, you know, she would, he would try to talk, and obviously, without a jaw. You know, it just sounds like, you know, babble, but she could understand him, and she would translate for him, and it was just, it was something to see. The guy was the guy was phenomenal, and uh, uh, thought the world of him, and, and he's going to be very much missed. And a matter of fact, people ask about how did you name Virgil? You know, because like, Virgil's real name is not Virgil, and so it was funny. Uh, Bobby Heenan on on just a whim said, you know, um, 
you know, uh, it was like a, it was like a rib because wrestlers are famous for ribs, and it was it was a rib on Dusty Rhodes because Dusty's real name was Virgil Runnels, and so let's see, let's call him Virgil, and so we we named him Virgil. That was Bobby. It was Bobby Heenan's idea. So that's just a little tidbit for you. Fantastic. BG, final question. Do you think wrestlers today should always try to stay in character outside of the ring when they're not on television? Uh, no. I mean, why? Why? I mean, it's like, you know, back when I first got in the business and I grew up in the business, you know, my dad was a wrestler. So I grew up in, in, in I grew up in, in, the, in the business when uh, uh, we kept what you call kayfabe. We, you know, we, we didn't we didn't tell everybody. I mean, it's like you go to a magic show. You know that you know you know that guy can't really make an elephant disappear, but he did. How would he do it? I mean, so what are the tricks of the trade? So we just we we're hush hush, and we you know if you want to believe it's real, we'll make you believe it's real. But today it's out in the open. It's we're sports entertainment. So why try to be that? Why be somebody that you're not? I mean, it'd be like asking Tom Cruise to you know maintain a character of a, of a party played in the movie. It's it's uh, it's not reasonable. Well, a huge thank you to our guest tonight, Ted DiBiase. Check out his new movie, The Price <clears throat> of Fame, at theaters nationwide on November seventh. Tell the fans where else they can support you. Well, you know, if you want to know where you can see The Price of Fame, go to thepriceoffame dot com, and I believe if you enter in your area code, uh, then you can find out what the, the the theaters in your area might be where you can where you can, you can view the film and uh, uh if you want to stay in contact with me uh mdm ted dibiase that is my twitter handle i also have a public facebook a page facebook page and uh, you can find me on facebook as well uh two websites uh, milliondollarman.com and heartofdavidministry.com so there's several ways you can get a hold of me. You can you can email me at either one of the at either one of the uh, the websites as well. Well, another huge thank you to Ted DiBiase. Good luck moving forward, sir. Thank you very much, guys. And remember one one very important thing, okay? Everybody's got a price for the million dollar man. <laughs> I just had to do it. The the, the child in me oh, almost just made me so it, happy. It just ripped out of my <laughs> chest and just like knocked me over. It was like, yeah, I'm kick the ball again. So I'm, I'm very excited. <laughs> I, again, thank you so much. Good luck. Good luck moving forward. Thanks, guys.